helping people who are broken and who are needy is the best way to minister to the Lord. Throughout my life, I, I found myself being drawn to people who were broken and people who um, were hurting and people who didn't have a voice. My mother was abusive in just about every way imaginable. Um, and my father was bipolar, and so he was real unst unstable for most of my childhood. And while living with my mother, um, I was sexually abused, physically abused, mentally abused, and pretty much seemed like the kind of men that she was attracted to were the kind of men that were attracted to me for a long time. I didn't know anything about sex trafficking. I didn't know anything about anything, but I knew that these women were daughters of the king and that they didn't know that they were. The age that most of the abuse started that I know of was around age four. This went on off and on until I was six, and then her rights were permanently terminated. It's really funny when you grow up in the church, especially when you come from a legalistic background, um, you're always told that the worst people in the world were the prostitutes and the tax collectors. And I found out that the women that I met were some of the best people I'd ever met. They are, they are passionate. They are deeply devoted to their families. They would do anything for their families. Um, they love and serve extravagantly, um, watching them worship God. It's, it's one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see because um, they're, they're coming from a place of being truly redeemed and restored by God. Um, a lot of times they, I consider them my heroes for the strength that they have and the love that they're willing to still give and the hope that they've never lost. It became normal. It felt pretty normal. The abuse was so regular and started so young that I really didn't know that it was supposed to be different. Um, I remember I was scared a lot, and I used to put myself in these little fantasy worlds to kind of hide. And I'm a little sarcastic and um, loud, and I fit in great with those girls. <laughs> Because they're funny and they're loud and I felt at home with them, you know? So I knew I want to do this for the rest of my life. I don't know how and I don't know in what capacity, but I know that I want to do this. I love it. I love outreach. I love meeting them where they are. I love getting to know their hearts and seeing the Lord do a remarkable work in their lives. I spent a lot of time in and out of foster homes, in and out of shelters and group homes. And while in foster care, more abuse happened more than once with different families. And finally, after years from like, I think six to like 10, years of being moved around constantly, having no stability, um, got put in institutions a couple of times for like, behavior problems and depression, which I don't think I really was depressed or anything. I just wasn't sure they had anywhere to put me at the times. So um, I, I spent a little time in mental institutions, which I don't think I needed to be there ever. And um, then my father finally gained custody back of me and he, um, did the best he could to help restore our lives and get us back to being normal. And he had a girlfriend that he had been living with for a couple of years that tried to keep him pretty stable and on his medicine. And um, But then he passed away when I was 11. After a little while, we came under the nightlight umbrella. Um, we were doing nightlight anyway. And so we came under Nightlight, and Nightlight Atlanta looks to address the issues of commercial sexual exploitation through prevention, intervention, restoration, and education. So prevention, the average age of entry into prostitution in the U.S. is between the ages of 11 and 14 years old. 
And so we're talking about middle schoolers. Um, risk factors for entry into prostitution is poverty, um, lack of education, parental neglect, conflict at home. The main risk factor for entry into prostitution is a history of childhood sexual abuse. The church kind of got ruined for me when I was in a foster home. I was living with this couple that was um, Christian, and they had pretty strict rules about not having sex until you're married, um, and would make me sit in my room and read the Bible for hours, even though I didn't understand. I think I was like seven or eight. I didn't understand a word of what the Bible was saying. Um, but they would make me read the Bible as a punishment when I got in trouble. Um, one time I was acting out because I had got accused of doing something that I didn't really do. And they held me down and put olive oil on my head and said they were taking demons out of me. And um, one time they made me sit in a bathtub full of ice water as a punishment. And the whole time their son was touching me inappropriately, um, rubbing himself on me any time that we were in the house alone. And he had taken the oath of not having sex until he was married. And um, I, it was a joke to me after that. I was so hypocritical. It was crazy. So I never thought about God after that. We do outreach once a week where we go on the streets and the strip clubs into the brothels, into the hotels where the individuals are soliciting. We build relationships with them. We get to know them. We get to know their hearts. And we say, when you're ready, not if you're ready, but when you're ready, we can help you and we want to help you. My dad never moved out of the town that I was abused in. So all of my mother's ex-boyfriends and all of those people still lived like blocks away from where his house was. And after he passed away, like a month after, uh, his girlfriend moved another man in. And then, of course, once again, more abuse. I think the worst thing that happened to me after my father died while I was still living with his girlfriend is one of the men accused of abusing me as a child, which we went to court for and everything, came and spent the night at our house. And so, of course, he came into my room. Lies about their own being responsible for the things that happened to them, that they're, they're bad, and um, you hear that lie all the time, that they're not good enough for the Lord, that there's too much sin in their life, that they're a lost cause, um, and then their value, that they're just not valuable. Um, I would say when an individual is sexually abused or sexually assaulted, the main thing that's stolen from them is their they're, they feel their worth, their value is stolen. So once they don't feel valuable or worthy, they, they give up. They say, well, that was taken from me, so I guess I'll make money off of it now. My abusers pretty much made it seem like I was seducing them. And after a while, because it was more than one person, and it constantly kept happening, of course I would believe that. It had to be something I was doing if it was more now. If it was just one person, then maybe I would have believed that it wasn't my fault. But since it happened repeatedly and it seemed like no matter where I went, that type of a person got drawn to me. So, yes, I believe that it was my fault. So I finally, at like 11 and a half, ran away from living with my stepmom. And I never went back. From that point on, I was staying the night at friends' houses, sneaking through windows before they had to go to school, or sneaking in and out, um, sometimes staying with older men for a couple of days, basically just staying wherever I could. 
I was pretty much homeless. And um, then by like 12 and a half, maybe 13, somewhere in there, I eventually learned that I could um, make money from doing what I was already doing to survive. And so the prostitution escalated from that. When I was in the city, I was walking around one day. I had a, just gotten into a fight with one of my boyfriends and kind of got kicked out. And I was walking down the street and a Spanish man stopped me and asked me if I needed a ride. And I said, sure. And when I got in the car, he offered me money in return for that. I guess he thought I already was working or something. I don't know. So I agreed. He paid for me a hotel room for the week, um, gave me a little lump sum of cash, and I got started from there. Then I started working the hotel where he had took me to, just walking around the hotel and on the street right there, and more customers came, and then it just escalated from that into going to trucks, truck stops and escort services and... This continued on until I was 19. I ended up with a lot of drug dealers, but I never ended up with a hardcore pimp. And I've always thanked God for that because I've seen a lot of what my friends have went through in that situation. And that's a hard situation to get out of. I've had a lot of bad experiences with pimps. Um, I've even had one try to kidnap me one time. I think how I defended myself against them was that I always had a man around me, constantly. If he wasn't my boyfriend, he was one of the known drug dealers in the area. I always, every time I moved to another state or another community where I was going to make money, I always befriended someone who was in a power position in that area whether I was his girl or I was a really good friend. I've had violence bestowed upon me from people that I was seeing outside of paying customers, like boyfriends and um, guy friends. I've had a situation where I was riding down the street with this guy that I was just fooling around with. We weren't really serious and he slapped me so I pulled a knife out and he used my knife to stab me and my shoulder. Um, I had a really crazy boyfriend one time that was a lot older than me and he was really abusive. Um, so I fell into a lot of abusive relationships. I've been put in some pretty scary situations, but I guess God was with me the whole time because I never got seriously hurt. I learned not to do hardcore, like crack cocaine or meth and stuff like that because like I said, half the time that I was in the streets, I befriended and dated drug dealers. So I seen the type of clientele that would come to them and what they were doing and how they looked and how they were dressed and how they smelled. And it wasn't what I wanted to look like or how I wanted to be known in the community. I had this hardcore facade of like, I'm a gangster and I would rob people and do stuff like that. So I think that that's pretty much what saved me from the drug phenomenon. And then I was a control freak. I think that that's the main reason I wanted to be a prostitute so bad because I had control over who I gave my money to, who I didn't give my money to, what I spent my money on. I had control over who touched me and who didn't touch me. I had control over who left and came into my life in most situations. Um, I just was in total control. Nobody was taking anything from me anymore that I wasn't giving them. I think the only time I really prayed was when I thought I was about to go to jail or I thought I was in trouble or when I was in a tight spot. I never prayed or wondered anything like that. I kind of 
thought, this is my life. Nothing's going to be done about it. This is who I chose to be. And if I'm going to be it, I'm going to be the best at it. And crying and praying and having emotions was weak. I really had got pretty cold hearted. I really didn't care anymore. When I turned 18, I went on a total path of destruction. I was going to different cities with people. I had gotten to the point where I would get on the ground and go anywhere. I wouldn't know anybody, wouldn't know where I was at. I would just go. I was partying constantly. I was making bukus of money. I was just a part, a part, down hard party girl. That's all I would do is make money and party, make money and party. And then I met my children's father around that time. And I think God kind of put him in my life. When we do outreach, you know, outreach is really fun. Um, a lot of times if you have the great gift of gab, it works out well for you to, when you're doing outreach, asking the girls about themselves, about their hair, about their nails, asking them about their children. Um, I mean, that'll get anybody talking because everybody's so, they're proud of their children. And so we just, we, we get to know who they are, what makes them excited, what makes them sad. As we, as we get to really know them and they get to trust us, um, then we really get to dig into some of their stuff. Even in a short time period, the Lord can reveal himself. And so we always offer prayer, always. Um, one girl, I was, we were in the, in the strip club, and she was telling me that she was upset about her, her mom moving away. And so I said, well, let's just see what the Lord has to say about that. And so I prayed with her, and she was weeping in, in the middle of the strip club with the music, dun, 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 you know. But the Lord, the Lord is everywhere. There's nowhere that's too dark for the Lord to be. And... Um, it's remarkable to see him show up in the darkest places and the scariest places. He's not afraid to go there. And so we just follow where he is. Then I met an organization um, called Kids Club, which would come out and minister to the children in the hotel that we were living at. And um, I just so happened to have my children on the playground that day. And I talked to one of the women that volunteered for Nightlight or that was in an organization called Nightlight. At the time, I wasn't sure what she was doing, but she just started talking to me. So I told her, I was like, man, I really want to get a job. You know, we're living in this hotel. I'm tired of this, like, everyday thing. I love my children. I can't remember everything I said, but... It's like, I'm tired of this. I know I lied to her about being a prostitute because since she didn't get me out there in that environment, she caught me in mommy mode. I tried to, you know, I wouldn't tell her the whole truth because I was scared of losing my children. And um, I found out that actually Nightlight was a great organization. They weren't there to take away your kids. They weren't there to make you feel like you were worthless. They were there to help you, introduce you to God, um, pray with you, try to teach you who God is. And so then she got me a job. Uh, she took me to the interviews to do the application, to do the drug test, and the man hired me. And from that point on, we started working to move my family out of the hotel, and we did. We got an apartment. The restoration piece is the longest and the hardest part of the whole process. Um, restoration takes time. Um, it takes patience. It takes grace and mercy. Um, you know, what do you do when you've seen the Lord show up time and time again in a person's life and they continue to go back to their destructive behaviors. Well, what the Lord has revealed to us is that he has revealed his grace and mercy to us time and time again. And therefore, we offer grace and mercy to the individuals 
time and time again. They're never too far. They're never not worth it to pursue. So uh, our, our ministry, our restoration ministry is very organic and it's very based on the needs of the individual because every woman's different. And so we start off, we have a follow-up team that calls the women and um, kind of reintroduces themselves or reintroduces us to them and um, says, what do you need? What do you want? What, what do you want? And the girls, the number one request that we've gotten is I want somebody to call me and invite me to church. Not, I want to go to church on my own. Not, tell me a good church in my area. Not, I want a church that has really good worship or a really good speaker. I want somebody to call me and invite me to church. So we start our mentor program where we pair an individual in the sex industry with a mentor. And um, the girl does not have to decide to leave the industry to be paired with a mentor. Um, she, the mentor comes alongside the girl and um, does life with them. It's, a, it's an individual that they can trust to be there in their life. We also do inner healing ministry. Then we started working on inner healing, which is a process of when we work out issues, almost like counseling, except for using God as our counselor. Like we talk about issues that happened as a child, the abuse, the institutionalization, the, everything that hurt us. And we relax and ask God, where were you in this? And he reveals himself and we say what we saw. And then all the judgments that we placed on other people, all the hurt that was caused to us and even hurt that we caused to others, we place it at the cross and ask God to give us back what was stolen from us. And going through inner healing sessions over that six month period, during that time, a lot of healing took place. I learned the true meaning of God. He's revealed himself to me time and time again, helping us through little situations that look like big hurdles, getting in the way of um, the road to redemption. I guess God was revealing himself to my husband through me at the time. And he was seeing how all this great stuff was happening in my life. And I was just being so blessed and I was so much happier. And even though money was tight, it didn't matter to me anymore. And I guess he kind of got on board. So we got engaged. And um, then I made the choice to be baptized. And with that, the cleansing took place. And then um, after the baptism, we had the wedding. And so we were married and just so many different miracles have been taking place. And I took the um, GED test and I passed the first try. And now I'm on my way to college in the next couple of weeks. So God has done some pretty miraculous things in my life. <laughs>